Uh, good morning and welcome to the 24th meeting of the Health and Sport uh, Committee in 2017. Could I ask everyone in the room to ensure their mobile phones are on silent? Uh, it's acceptable to use mobile devices for social media, but don't uh, photograph or record proceedings. Um, the first item on our agenda is the second evidence session on technology and innovation in health and social care. Um, we have a cast of thousands today, um, so we will uh, introduce each other in a moment. Um, could I say that if uh, anyone wants to speak in the, uh, or contribute, if they catch my eye or uh, committee team's uh, eye, we will uh, do our utmost to get everybody in. We want this to be a free-flowing discussion, so um, if you can try and keep your contributions pretty sharp, because we've got so many people here, and uh, we'll try and keep it as free-flowing as possible. Um, given the, the, the subject matter, I, I, I know there may be some members of the committee who wish to declare an interest, and I will begin uh, 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 by declaring an interest in this subject as a, a member, a close member of my family works in the uh, health technology field. Uh, Brian? I'm director of a collaboration communication platform um, that includes health service. Okay. Marie? I guess I should declare I'm a member of the um, General Pharmaceutical. I'm a registered pharmacist registered with the General Pharmaceutical Council. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so um, I'll introduce myself, then we'll go around and people can uh, very briefly introduce themselves. So uh, Neil Finlay, I'm the Chair of the Health and Sport Committee and uh, MSP for the Lothians. I'm Claire Hockey, I'm the Deputy Convener of the Health and Sport Committee and I'm the MSP for Rutherglen. I'm Brian McKinstry, I'm the Professor of Primary Care eHealth at the University of Edinburgh and a working general practitioner. My name is Tom Arthur and I'm the MSP for Renfrewshire South. I'm Juliette Spiller, I'm a consultant in palliative medicine at the Marie Curie Hospice here in Edinburgh and I'm representing the Scottish Partnership for Palliative Care. I'm Miles Briggs, I'm MSP for Lothian Region. I'm Rami Okash, I'm the Executive Director of Strategy and Improvement at the Care Inspectorate. Morning everyone, I'm Alex Cole Hamilton, I'm Lib Dem MSP for Edinburgh West End. Good morning, uh, I'm Stephen Whiston, I'm the Head of Strategic Planning and Performance for Argyll and Butte Health and Social Care Partnership. Morning, I'm Jenny Goldruth, I'm the MSP for Mid Fife and Glenrothes. I'm David Chung, I'm a consultant in emergency medicine at Cross House in Kilmarnock and I'm the Vice President of the uh, Royal College of Emergency Medicine. Alison Johnston, MSP for Lothian. I'm Aileen Bryson, I'm Practice and Policy Lead at the Royal Pharmaceutical Society. Uh, Ivan McKee, MSP for Glasgow Proven. I'm uh, Charlie Hutchie, I'm the Chief Technology Officer with the Digital Health and Care Institute. Uh, Brian Whittle, MSP, South of Scotland Region. <coughs> Uh, Marie Todd, MSP for the Highland and Ireland region. Good morning, I'm Maureen Faulkner, I'm the Regional Manager of the Information Commissioner's Office here in Scotland. Good morning, I'm uh, Colin Smith, MSP for South Scotland. Okay, thank you. We've got around uh, an hour to 75 minutes for the session, so we need to get underway quickly. Colin, do you want to begin? Thanks very much, Convener, and, and welcome to the panel. One of the reasons that the committee decided to carry out an inquiry into technology and innovation in health and social care is the fact that in almost every aspect of our work, from healthcare in prisons to, to speaking to GPs about new models of care, there was a huge frustration um, at the barriers that, that seem to exist when it comes to, to patient information sharing uh, across healthcare professionals. Can I just get people's thoughts on why in 2017 do we still have such a, a wide variation of recording data within the NHS, a complete lack of integration uh, when it comes to the various systems, and why don't we have a single platform for patient information? Easy question. Who wants to go first? Can I answer? Yes. Yeah, attempt to answer yeah. that one. <laughs> uh, I think fundamentally it's historical, um, and when we had the... Um, so-called internal market within health, uh, I think that's when all of the, the uh, unified systems um, were broken up uh, and became quite disparate. Uh, certainly my own research has, has been in health uh, prior to um, joining the Information Commissioner's Office and that was certainly something that, that came to the fore when I spoke to health boards across Scotland. Um, that it was trying to bring that back together again, what was the big issue? And there tended to be, a, a, well, if that's how Glasgow's doing it, Edinburgh's not going to do it like that attitude uh, in respect of, of um, technology, I would say. Uh, that system, no, no, we're not going to use that system, we'll use this system. So it's trying to bring it back together again. But I think also, as well as the, the technological problems that you have, I think the, the elephant in the room is the data protection. People often look at data protection as being the stumbling block um, and the obstacle to information sharing. 
And I think I would just put on record to say that the preamble to the Data Protection Act currently and also the new General Data Protection Regulation that's coming into force on the 25th of May next year talks about the protection of personal information. But what a lot of people don't realise, it also says that it's set up to um, allow for the free movement of personal information. So a lot of our work in Scotland, particularly in health, is saying to people, can you share? Yes, you can. The Data Protection Act is a framework for safe and secure sharing of information and not the barrier that a lot of people think it is. Brian? Yeah. Can I just echo that? I think the, the major issue is IT governance um, across the various different places. There's marked difference in the interpretation of the regulations from health board to health board. So for example, in Lothian, we have banned Google Chrome, um, whereas the rest of the country is still using this. And I think we need to have a single IT governance for the whole of Scotland. It's, it's crazy to have all of these different um, small groups making up their own mind as to what is and isn't acceptable. Yes. So that was going to be my answer to that question, which is um, we have, you know, the, the distribution of decision making uh, around investment in IT infrastructure is a big issue. Um, if you look at uh, Finnish, Estonian, Galician, and other um, European countries that are progressing quite quickly in these spaces, they have a a slightly more authoritarian approach in, with regard to setting a common standard uh, and having a central voice that says, this is the way we're going to do this. Um, and in these, in these countries, you actually see the Prime Minister is chairing the data sharing committees and an authority is put in saying, this is the way we're doing this. And is it better that way? Better I'm, I'm sure plenty of people would, would argue either way, but um, their digital accessibility measures and the, the bench, benchmarks across Europe, they are significantly further ahead than the other countries. Hey, Juliet, yeah. I think a single IT governance structure is, is essential for what we need to do in Scotland for, for e-health. I would make a plea, though, that we have significant resource into supporting that with clinical expertise, because what we don't do at the moment is, is we don't resource clinicians to actually provide their time to support the IT work that, that happens. We don't do that properly. So all of the work that happens, most of the work that happens in Scotland that improves IT resources and, and focuses it on, on what patients need is delivered by patients, carers and clinicians who are doing it in their own time. And if you want it done better and quicker, you actually need to resource people to do it properly and to work together with people who know how to do it in IT because we have huge amounts of expertise in Scotland particularly around e-health, IT uh, technology and, and what can be done. And, and you need the clinicians and the IT um, experts to work together with patients and carers to actually m make it exactly what people need. Hey, Stephen? What, what everyone else has said so far, but the, the material point to me is around that integration of health and social care information. And it's great to hear you know, that there should be no bar to sharing appropriate information, read and write access to all, because that's the biggest frustration from all the health and care professionals that I come across and our third sector partners. We want to radically transform health and social care. That's where we've got to address it. And we have a plethora of systems at the moment that just piles on frustration, piles on mythology about data protection. We can't do this because of Caldecott Guardian. I've got to go through this boards, that local authorities, data controller, so on and so forth. We set ourselves up to fail because we're tripping up over duplication. So anything we could do to simplify that, I know from my colleagues, and the health and care, coalface, they welcome that with open arms. And stuff to simplify it. We are attempting to, within, uh, colleagues made the point, the resources that we've got, we're, we're attempting to bring our community nurses onto the same social care system in Argyll and Butte. That's taken a long time and a lot of culture and issues, professional issues around that. Um, I look at the new GP contract that's currently being negotiated. I have practice nurses who can access the GP system. I have health visitors who can't. I have district nurses who can't. I have GPs who will share some of that information with social work colleagues. This is just bonkers, and it's the biggest frustration we've got. So we are tempted to do that, but we have limited resources to put that in place, because I'm dealing with just primary care, independent business, social care, local authority system, and NHS system. And what would it take to get it to where you want it to be? It takes that single, single type of approach, single governance with a single agency driving it, would be my, my recommendation. Does anybody around the table disagree with that? No? OK. I just comment that, again, if you're looking at international comparators, it's not just about health and care. 
you know, benefit system, social security, these sorts of things are critical components. Um, so there's a big opportunity to, to, to dovetail that kind of work. Okay, Rami? I think the um, evidence that we've collected suggests that the points that have been made are, are, are very much borne out in terms of the interoperability of ICT systems across health and social care. I think it's worth pointing out two things. Firstly, that doesn't prevent um, effective systems from being put in place to support access to those systems for different professionals, and there is some evidence of examples where that's working, although I appreciate that's a, a workaround rather than a, a solution to the problem. I suppose the second point relates to what Stephen says, which is around the complexity of the health and social care partners that are working. So it isn't just ICT systems in use in health boards or indeed within the 31 integration authorities. There are some 4,000 individual care uh, service providers for adults across Scotland who are their own organisations that are commissioned by integration authorities but aren't part of integration authorities. So there is a really complex landscape that I think needs to be borne in mind when we think about what one system might really look like. David? I would echo everything that's been said. I think whether the, the reality of the situation or not, operationally, the data protection is considered to be the biggest barrier. And who owns the data? So let's say every single GP out of hours system in Scotland cannot access the GP's patient data for those GPs, which is just insane. Um, so you go and see a patient and you can't find out anything about that patient that you're going to go and see. And therefore, you do the safest thing, which is probably going to be admit them to hospital. Whereas they can't even access care. I think so. The question is, who owns the data? And I would say, be more radical. Let the patient own their own data. The patients already think we know everything about them. They come to an emergency department and we say, "Oh well," and they say, "Oh, it's all in my record, doctor." I say, "We don't know what's in your record. We don't know anything." Oh, you don't know? They think we're joking. They think we're lazy and we can't look because they're used to every other aspect of their life. Facebook know everything about them. Google know everything about them. They've consented to that data sharing. So we're hamstrung by that. So I'd say if you gave a patient an option to say, do you want to have a smart card with your data on? Lots of people might actually say, well, I'll just take it and I know where my records are and then I can give it to you and you know what my records are. And that's what I want to do. Different people are different. And resources, very much so, but even on more basic operational levels. So there's been good software being brought in, which is good. And then various bits of the healthcare system are saying to me, well, we'd like to have that, but we've been told there's no cash for it this year. So we've not got a portal for these results. You'll have to go and apply to get the paper notes. And it's even even at a more basic level than development. Um, and the third thing I would say is if you're going to bring in a system, please engage the frontline cl clinicians to the extent of just saying, what do you want? What do you want it to do? Because a lot of the existing software has come from another country where its main purpose appears to be to collect data to bill as opposed to do a clinical job to do the best thing for the patient and share information to their benefit. Supplementary. Um, Aileen Bryson, in your submission, you talk about pharmacist access to the patient healthcare record would improve patient care by enabling pharmacists to play an even greater role uh, in the provision of safe and effective unscheduled care. And I should also say that I've visited a couple of community pharmacies and, and one with Aileen um, to see how that can work and somehow sometimes how that data sharing puts a block to what the pharmacist is trying to do. Um, is anybody aware today, or perhaps Aileen, this might be specific to you, of areas in which that data sharing is working well and perhaps where other areas can learn from? Because if we're all agreed here today that, well, you're all agreed that, that a national standard should be agreed, there must be areas that other parts of the country might be able to look at for best practice. Yeah, absolutely. You're quite right. And I echo everything that's been said already. And I think it's really interesting to hear everybody talking about how disparate it is, how piecemeal it is, um, and everybody's saying from the one um, sheet on that. Yeah. And where we do have it, even when it is piecemeal and it's been piloted and tried, and yes, it is working, but sometimes it's very clumsy mm -hmm. um, and it's not smart working. So we have instances where... where even if a pharmacist has access to the portal, they have to have the patient's permission each time they use it. So when most of our prescribing and dispensing is done ahead of time to help with work planning and for patient uh, access as well, that means that if there's a query on a prescription and you know up to one in 20 prescriptions could have a query on them, maybe one in 500 GMC would say it has a clinically significant uh, query or error, um, the pharmacist then has to try and get hold of a patient. If, a, if it's a carer or the family that comes in, how do they access that? So very clumsy ways of doing things. And things like the ECS, which, yes, they can access, but they have to do it through NHS 24. There's no direct access, and that's been promised since 2014. So you have to phone NHS 24. Uh, lots of times where there's extra phone calls, extra time, and we have lobbied for a long time on this, saying that we could work much smarter with what we've got, but 
but it is one of the areas where we do need extra resource and we don't have the national leadership and driver um, to actually pull it all together. So I'm really heartened to hear all the, the comments around the table which uh, echo our sentiments exactly. Um, things like what somebody is supposed to get a phone call about their warfarin, high-risk medicine, on a Friday night from a GP practice, and for lots of different reasons, um, the, that phone call doesn't come to a little old lady who is totally distressed phoning NHS 24, wanting to know how many tablets she needs to take at six o'clock at night. And we can't do anything about that until Monday. Whereas if we had direct access, then we could sort that out and make sure that she gets the right dose. If she doesn't get the right dose, she could very well end up in hospital again the next week. So it's sometimes difficult to quantify, but the long-term aims and objectives of this, everybody is, is talking from the same, um, the, the same sheet on, on this one, um, because there are short-term gains and there are long-term gains, and we're missing out on them all. This issue? Yeah. Particularly on the pharmacy issue, I mean, I'm struck, and I was struck when I was working as a pharmacist, as a hospital pharmacist, at the differences within the profession. So community pharmacists have no access to data, and hospital pharmacists have access to all of the data. So I could access medical notes, I could access lab results, and, and it makes it impossible, actually, for community pharmacists to fulfil their obligations of pharmaceutical care. So, for example, I worked in psychiatry, there was a... Uh, a, a drug lithium which requires there's an obligation on the community pharmacist to check whether certain tests have been done how on earth can a community pharmacist do that without access to lab results so we have a situation where the same health professional can access different information depending on where they're working so they're not able to work to access in community but they are able to access it if they're working in the gp practice and we have lots of pharmacists who are working in a hybrid model which seems to be working really really well because you know the patients really well so everything that the college of emergency medicine said about out of hours is particularly where it falls down so it is as jane said it's for continuity of care and there are patient safety issues and we've got lots of examples of where we could we, we can be putting patients at risk because of their monitoring of high-risk medicines and not everybody having access to that information. And that includes social care, where we've had examples of uh, lots of going around the houses to get information from social care, uh, which if we'd had at, at our fingertips would have helped going into a domiciliary visit. So small piecemeal things, which together actually mean we're not getting the impetus and the traction that we need. Thanks. This is actually moving on. From this issue, convener. I don't know if you want uh, to bring it in. Is there other people who want to come in? Juliet, we'll come back to Alec. Okay. Thank you. It was really just to um, to, to focus. You'd mentioned the out of hours issue, Eileen, and and I think certainly when you're looking at care of patients with complex conditions, long term conditions, and particularly patients with terminal illness. Out of hours care is, we, we know that's where it often all falls down. And one of the great things that we have achieved in Scotland is that, that we have the key information summary, which is a, is a once for Scot Scotland approach to out of hours emergency information. And, and it's heartening that that is in place, but we need to use it better. Now, there are lots of pockets of expertise where clinicians and teams and patients and carers have done workarounds. But nobody has time to pick their head up and look at what other people are doing, and nobody has time to take their local practice and, and make it more widely known. So I, again, somebody with the overview to, to do that, to look at local practice and see, oh, that's working really well there. I wonder if that would work in different health boards. So you end up with lots of different areas of, of local practice um, and, and very dis disparate effects. And one of the things that, that we, we know is, is that patients who have a terminal illness and die absolutely need a kiss. And that's one of the, the visions for the Scottish Government is that by 2021, every patient who would benefit from a kiss in Scotland will have one. Now, we know from the figures that Marie Curie has collected that, um, that we're, we're just at about half of the patients who died in Scotland last year who, who had palliative care need um, had a kiss in place. So we're, we're getting there, but, but we're very far short of the mark. But we also don't know what the quality of that kiss information is. And when you look at secondary care, when the patient hits the front door, how many of those clinicians actually know that a kiss exists, know how to access it, and actually make use of that information? And quality improvement work that we did in, in West Lothian showed that of, of the patients who had a kiss, only 4% of those, that kiss information was accessed when they hit the front door of the, of the acute hospital. 
quality improvement work can improve that, but all of, all of these projects are happening right across Scotland and nobody's pulling it all together. And that's a system that we have in place that could work dramatically well to change patient care now, overnight, if we actually resourced it and did it properly. So, and that's not to mention what we need for the future. So KISS is fine, but it, we have pushed it as far as we can for the complex level of advanced decision making that we need to meet patients' needs for the future in Scotland. We need something much more sophisticated and much more accessible. Just following on from that, one of the main reasons that this isn't done is because the systems are so hard to use and so difficult and general practice systems are not fit for purpose. I think it's the single biggest complaint in general practice across the country. We're dealing with Windows XP, we're dealing with Internet Explorer 6, it takes ages to do anything and actually completing the KISS is difficult because it's, you have to go through several different screens in order to do it. It's very, very hard. Sending messages to, to pharmacists. I sit and watch this hourglass when I do my repeat prescribing. I do write a prescription for five prescriptions and I say this hourglass sitting in front of me. All over the country there are GPs and nurses looking at this hourglass waiting for it to clear so they can do the next prescription. It's disgraceful. We are working with a four megabyte download speed a 0.4 megabyte upload speed. How many of you would accept that in your own houses? Nobody would. And yet we are working with that day in and day out. So, but on the back of that, <laughs> <laughs> what then, I suppose the key question is, what's been done about it? Are we seeing progress in this? Because, you know, we've only been in here 20 minutes and we get the picture. We certainly get the picture. And I'm glad you've said it like you have, because that's what we need to hear. So what's being done? David. Wait, things are better. In Ayrshire, where I work, we only got Portal in the last 12 months. Glasgow had it for ages before. But now we've got it in an emergency department situation. It is invaluable in having the most up-to-date, let's say, clinicians' opinions, having access to ECS and KISS there as well. It works. It's, it's much, much faster. And that, that's better. So that's something, a system which has, has shown some promise to give clinicians some of what they want and hasn't taken and, and is reasonably easy to use. And thinking about, well, how do that, and has everywhere got it that easy? Because not everywhere has. Which systems have we got that people are happy with? Like, you say, okay, and can we roll them out as soon as possible to also get people believing in it? Because everybody thinks, oh, I can't be bothered with another failed IT thing. I can't, you know, what, where should I invest my effort in this? Because they're all rubbish and I just get told to use them. And I don't want to. So there's a cultural um, sort of bias to overcome. And if we think, well, these places, you know, use best practice and say, can we make it happen somewhere, make it happen as many places as possible? And people start to go, do you know what? Actually, that's all right. I can see why I, I, might, I might invest some time and do a bit of training and other sorts of things in this. But that's extremely ad hoc. Right. Extremely ad hoc. Well, why, why, where are the national programmes of rollout of successful integrated well, systems is there a plan? When we speak to the, um, some of the civil servants that come in, um, they, they kind of shrug their shoulders and say, things take time. Well, I think you might have hit the nail on the head. There isn't a national programme. So local places do, have an, everybody's got different priorities. One chief exec might say, the f money is the bottom line. Another chief exec go, this patient safety issue is the bottom line, and they're going to do, trim their sales accordingly. OK, I've got a large number of people who want to come in on a number of issues here. Um, I've got Alex, Claire, Alison, uh, Sharoner and Ivan so far uh, on this issue, Ivan. Yeah, if, if you can indicate if it's on this issue, then then we'll go with that first. Ivan. Yeah, it was basically just following up on, um, on your question, Convener. I, I suppose what I'd be interested to know is what people think needs to be done to move this forward, because you're right, we're hearing the consensus that it needs to be more, horrible word for a politician to use, but more centralised. Um, and, um, but it's how do we get from where we are to where we need to be? Does it require legislation? Does it require reorganisation? Does it require government to do something, pulling stuff back to the centre? Does it require direction of resources? What needs to happen to get from where we are to where everybody, I think, agrees we need to be? Shall I? Yeah, so my point was linked to that. Um, I'm just going to represent some of our kind of global market analysis work that we do as, as, as part of our day job. And so if you hear me talking about some other countries, that's, that's kind of why I'm here. Um, 
if I was to reflect on some of these other countries, and you know, people will say one way or another for Estonia and Finland, they're different in some ways, similar in others, but there's, a, there's some common things that they do. Um, uh, the first one is that information sharing is not an IT issue. Yeah, it, it is a fundamental service design issue. So it, this is not something that IT managers can get together and fix. And so when you actually see the people involved in creating the solutions for that, uh, they are a very mixed bag of people and they have, as I said, the very highest level of political mandate and leadership uh, of someone saying this is the way it's going to happen. Um, the second thing they do is they uh, have a similar thing to Scotland's kind of once for Scotland kind of thought process, but they don't let that turn into a national IT project where everything is created centrally, distant from the use case, uh, you know, and, and they construct it in isolation, which is what we've seen in the UK a, a, a few times. Uh, what they do is they instead say, well, what tools can we put in place? What standards can we put in place? And then can we enforce some of those things such that everyone is in the same playground playing with the same toys uh, so that at least when people make diverse choices at the point of care, because they're going to need to, you need to satisfy clinical and patient requirements. Um, you can do that in a way that at least attaches to a spine, and that spine is consistent and, and, and mandated, and, and there is no choice but to, 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 to aggregate to that spine. So those are the two main things that the countries that are leapfrogging ahead seem to do. So for a technophobe like me, mm -hmm. that's a central system that you plug into with different elements that all coordinate through that central system yeah so, so there is no there is no there is no one package there's no one software solution that will do this by any stretch of the imagination and any thought process that you can create that is complete folly there are tens of thousands of use cases with tens of thousands of interfaces for different someone living with ms is completely different from someone living with diabetes etc you have to respect that but what you can do is, for example, we talked about personally held data or the citizen having their own data. There is no vehicle by which a citizen can hold their own data. So someone, a governmental role would be, how does a citizen hold a version of their record? Right? We can put in place something that allows them to do that, that is open, that allows a citizen to consent to the sharing of that data whenever they want to, uh, but doesn't um, require them to use a specific interface based on a central government program. So you can put in a lot of the enablers without necessarily mandating a very specific experience. I'm pretending I know what you're talking about <laughs> here. I suspect there's a few others around the table the same. Um, I think I do actually get the three. So, so once for Scotland doesn't necessarily mean one software system yeah. that everyone is forced to use. Yeah. Okay, Juliet. So, so some of the things that have been happening over the, over the last few years have, around uh, palliative and end of life care and anticipatory care planning have been quite exciting and I, I think what I would like to see is, is is the Scottish government valuing strong clinical leadership to take the recommendations of a number of government commissions to find out what's happening and 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 recommendations that come off those commissions and and actually then roll that out and embed that into clinical practice because that's the bit that, that we don't resource so we resource the commissions we resource the IT know-how to do that sometimes, although it's usually very squeezed. Um, but once those commissions finish, sometimes nothing happens. You know, we, we, we end up with a report. So, for example, I've been asking for two years for somebody to work out why all of the independent Scottish hospices in Scotland cannot link with NHS IT systems. They all now have rolled out their own electronic patient record systems. They are all slightly different. Some of them use the same system, some of them use different systems. None of them can link directly from within that patient record to NHS IT systems. Bonkers. So I have been asking for two years for the Scottish Government to find out why that's happening and find out what's need to, needed to sort it. And they have just agreed a commission to do that, what I am terrified of is that that commission will find out what the problems are and then nothing will happen off the back of that. So we need very strong clinical leadership to make sure that that commission results in action. Now, you can't tell independent hospices what to do, but you can set standards and you can say this is the recommendation and, and you can make it in, in their best interest. Everybody wants to provide good patient care. Everybody wants to do that as efficiently and effectively as, as possible. So if you provide them with, with the resources to, to, to do that and the IT support to do that, NHS IT should be supporting independent hospices and care homes and social carers 
to access NHS IT systems. And, and the initial bit is finding out why it doesn't happen, but the, the next bit is the more important bit, and you need really strong, resourced clinical leadership to make that happen. A number of reports like this sitting on desks somewhere that say you have to do this in order to take this agenda forward. They recommend. Yeah, and <laughs> we recommend you do X, Y and Z, but they are sitting in a civil servant's cupboard somewhere or on a, on a civil servant's computer system, could yeah. be, um, with no actions happening. Is that is that too general or is that what's happening? Stephen? It's probably a little too general. I think it does come back to priorities. And the number of priorities across health and social care is vast. And absolutely, that point about mandating what we have to do to share information, to make it happen. The assumptions that are made by our, by our, our community, our users, that say, well, precisely that example. I expect you to know this about me. Why am I pitching up here and, and, I'm, and you're asking me the same question for the 15th time? Well, it, why aren't we doing that? And it's because we're not mandated to share the information. Taking absolutely account of that, that the information governance is not an issue. We can we address that? It's, it's stop it because we're not mandated, we're not told, directed to do it. By who should tell but, but by, it, it's a number of agencies, but there's, there's, no, there's no policy trickling down that says you must share this information for the best interests of your client and user. Because it is in this myth of actually, well, we can't do that because it's have you, data protection. Have you demanded that? Have you I, said I, we need this we, we, from I, you know, government, from whoever, the health boards, from I'll give whoever. you a little example. We're working hard in Argyll and Butte to integrate our GP out of hours, community hospital acute services, uh, daytime care services um, with our out of hours services. And I have a number of practices who look at their out of hours records and say, actually, I need that vision record but I'm not, you're not in my practice and I'm covering the service for you. Share that with me because I'm admitting your patient into your local community hospital. They'll come back and they'll say, well, actually, you know, I might be able to give you read access, or, but, you know, I'm not sure if I can do that. I've got to go with my Caldicott guy. And, and the clinicians just fall away. Why? And, well, because they're independent practices with their own independent requirements for Caldicott guardianship. So are they not, and, allowed, and, to, and, 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 are they not allowed to do that the, via... Real sit down by, I don't know, statute or information commissioner guidance or whatever? It's the way in which the, the NHS is set up in, with regard to GP practices is that GP practices are uh, formally data controllers. That makes them the legal entity for the personal information that they are using, processing in, in, in any shape, manner, or form. Uh, the problem is that because they are data controllers, there's nothing within the Data Protection Act that compels anyone to give any information out other than an order of the court. So it's for them to be satisfied that they can do whatever it is they're being asked to do. And it's, it's our experience in the Information Commissioner's Office that, by and large, it, from the GP practices, when we're out and about talking to um, uh, people about integration of health and social care. We're talking about, can I say the named person and not be struck down? The named person issues. Uh, and we're saying to people, well, no, you, you can you can share. It's, it's about proportionate sharing. It's appropriate sharing to the appropriate person. Uh, and then looking to the data protection framework to allow you to do that. And too often that is either seen as too hard uh, and, and people don't understand it. You know, it, it's... Consent is seen as the be-all and end-all. If I don't have your consent, I can't do anything with this information and I can't share it. And it couldn't be further from the truth. So therefore, between what you've said and what you've said, if you two speak to each other after this, you can sort it. The, well, we could sort it for us, but yeah, the problem is could, I would, I'd need to speak to every single GP Could I practice. encourage you to do that? Because that's, <laughs> that's one tick we can put against our session today. But seriously, we, because but, if people don't yeah, speak to each other, we yeah. won't resolve these problems. Right. I mean, one of the main reasons that people are risk averse, okay, that's the main reason. They don't understand the Act. They haven't got time to find out about the Act. And so they'll, they'll default to what they think is safest, okay? And so that's why people are worried about sharing data. And when you say it's okay if it's appropriate, well, what's appropriate? These people are worried about what's, 
been slapped with a £10,000 fine or something for having uh, revealed information that they shouldn't have revealed. And I know that the likelihood of that is very, very small, but you're talking about people who can choose one way or another what's the safest thing to do, and they'll choose the safest thing to do. In some ways, it would be better if GPs were not the data controllers, that there was one data controller for the whole NHS, and that would be so much better. Can I think uh, an abundance of people here. Uh, wait a minute, Tom. Alison, is your point another point, or you've been waiting very patiently for a long time? It is on the question of, okay. of access to, to data, so I think it is connected, definitely. Okay. And I'd, I'd probably introduce, uh, direct my questions to Maureen. Um, you know, you, you suggest in your evidence, and I think from what I've been hearing, this is all about appropriate and proportional access to data. Um, because there must be some concerns. I, I hear what Dr Chung is saying about should the patient be, be in control of, of their own data and, and who has access to it? I just wonder if there's any... I suppose patients would have to be very well versed in the implications um, and I suppose safety around that. You know, imagine if you know commercial interests got their hand on some of this, this data, the impacts of that could be quite... <laughs> devastating. So I just wonder, you know, what your views are um, on making sure that that access is proportionate, because you mentioned in your evidence the fact that sometimes counsellors and, you know, non-medical professionals have access to patient data because of partnerships with the third sector, for example. You know, how do we make sure that, that the data is never accessed by those who shouldn't have access to it? Well, I, I suppose that kind of speaks to uh, what Brian was saying, uh, that very often GP practices are just, they're scared. They, they're not being, I, I do not believe anyone is deliberately obstructive. I think people are genuinely scared and, as you say, risk averse. And therefore, the safest thing to do is just not, not to share it. I'll just hold on to all. Um, but I, I would say that the... This idea of whether GPs are, are data controllers is currently being looked at by Scottish Government and we are working with Scottish Government on that because the way in which you determine who is a data controller is fundamentally down to who determines the purpose and who determines the manner of processing. Now, the, there's a lot to say that the Health Board, via the regulations that sit around the GP practices, um, have got a lot to say about the purpose and the manner of processing. They've absolutely got everything to say about the manner of processing. A GP under the NHS can only process data using a, an IT system that has been provided or sanctioned, should I say, by Scottish Government. So that's why currently it's either EMIS or Vision. Um, if they want to use paper uh, records, then they can only use the type of form that the Health Board has determined that they can use. So there, there's a lot to say that you're quite right. The GP practice is taking on the data controllership responsibilities and liabilities for a lot of things that they actually don't have any meaningful control over. So there, there, it's being looked at to see whether the health board should actually be taking some of that control uh, and liability uh, and responsibility for, for the, the GP patient record as well. Yeah, that's what mm -hmm. being looked at means in terms of a timeline. Um, well, the GP contract, Brian, you can maybe correct me if I'm wrong, the GP contract's November, yes. so the working group has got to be reporting soon <laughs> uh, in order to be able to feed that into the, the kind of uh, timetable of, of agreeing so the, the GP contract. Yeah. This month, okay. Um, Claire. Thank you, convener, and thank you, panel, for coming along. See, I just wanted to pick up, and, and I suppose it's a query on something that Professor McKinstry said, and, and it's been partly answered by, by Maureen Faulkner. It was about GPIT systems, because you were quite vocal about the difficulties that GPIT systems have. Um, who is it that owns those GPIT systems? Indi indi in individual health boards own those systems. They, bu they bought them, yeah. Okay. So the GPs don't own those systems. And in terms of the actual, sort of, I suppose, the connectivity to, to the web, and you're talking about how, how quickly it downloads, and I, I'm as, as, as Luddite as Mr Finlay when it comes to, to IT, mm -hmm. um, so, uh, 
it's in terms of, of accessing say, internet and so on, who, whose responsibility is it for, for that part of the system? Again, it's the independent health force. If, these, if, you're, if you're using your own system, I mean, a lot of GPs have given up in this long ago and they use 4G on their phone when they want to look up something, say, on, you know, want to find out about an illness or something because it is just so slow. It is quicker to do, use your own phone on 3G or 4G to get this information. For example, we tried to introduce video consulting in Lothian and we had to actually put in separate IT systems into each of these practices because video could not run on the systems that we have at the moment. So on, on the actual set of broadband that they're, that they're accessing? So the broadband that we access runs at very, very slow speeds. You can do it, but we um, it's, it's very, very clunky indeed. You would never put up with it in any other sphere. Okay, and, and and is there an option for GPs to upgrade that? The way no, that you might do in not your not, not within the NHS. So <laughs> at the moment, if I wanted a faster speed in my surgery, I couldn't get it at the moment. So um, the only way I could do that is to purchase a separate broadband system myself, which would not be linked to the NHS. That would be the only way. And can I just ask, and this is a specific question because it's it's an issue that I've come up against in my constituency work about a. A, a GP practice which doesn't have a, a an email system apparently so we can't email is that something that you've come across in terms of GPs not accessing what what most of us would be used to as, as an everyday technology okay so um, we actually surveyed practices throughout the UK on their use of email and only a very small minority of GPs actually use email and a tiny proportion use it regularly there are two reasons for that one is most health boards um, or certainly some health boards do not permit general practitioners or doctors of any kind to use email for clinical reasons because they do not regard it as secure. Okay. The second reason is that doctors are very worried about the possible workload implications of setting up email, such as, uh, email um, services because they are worried they will be swamped with um, requests and that's a genuine, that's what we find in our survey. Requests for what? Information, they would have to reply to. I mean, the, the problem is we're talking about a system that is already, and we all know this, that is bursting at the seams. And general practitioners are not looking for any more work at the moment. I, I, I wasn't suggesting that we add, uh, give them more work. I'm just, it, it means then that instead of emailing them, we then have to write to them. So it doesn't reduce the work, it actually increases the workload because and increases the time that takes for information to be sought. I know this sounds like a terrible thing to say, but it's a lot harder to send a letter than to send an email. Very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> I, I do thank you for being straight up with us on that, and I think that raises a number of interesting points as well. Um, sorry, Alex. Um, well, thanks for coming to see us today. Um, just as a bookend to that discussion, I would like to make a direct request to Dr Spiller that she liaise with Clarks as to what government uh, or other commission recommendations are sitting in civil service drawers so that we as a committee might cross-examine that and interrogate the Scottish Government as to what uh, they know or what they've had recommended to them over the course of the last few years uh, and what we might use uh, to implement to make this practice better. It strikes me that in particularly in the case of community pharmacists, I've done a lot of work with Aileen, um, that, that actually there is a solution to a much broader crisis that we have in terms of staffing in our uh, GP sector in the sense that our GPs are on their knees at the moment in terms of workload and capacity and the community pharmacists could provide much of uh, the solution there in terms of um, some of the prescribing work that they could do better enhance if they had ready access to patient records. So just, just as a bookend comment on that. Um, my question, if I can take the discussion onto a, a, another aspect of innovation and technology in health and social care. Um, Around this time last year, I had a constituent who had spent several hundred days in hospital beyond the point at which they were declared fit to go home because there was not a, an adequate social care package available for them in the community. Um, that was £400 a night. It was costing NHS Lothian to retain that patient in, in well, in a state of positive health in a hospital where they didn't need to be because there wasn't means to give that patient a bed check at night to, to check for incontinence. I spoke to the uh, chair of the integrated joint board and as soon as I alerted it with, to them, they said, well, there were technologies available that, that could actually have performed that, that late night check without the need of having to employ a member of staff to come in. Um, I love, the, I love that we have technology like that, but I'm very concerned that if we can't get the basic IT right, as we've just discussed in respect of information sharing and uh, 
the cross fertilization of different IT systems. Um, how close are we to being able to roll out a uh, technology like that, which was finally offered to uh, my constituent before they were allowed to go home? Who would like to start us off in that moment? Uh, Shana? So, I mean, maybe I'll, I'll raise a slightly different example, but you, you can read across and maybe one that Brian is very familiar with around blood pressure monitoring, remote blood pressure monitoring. Um, if you take the sheer, I think it's, it's three in seven practice nurse appointments involves blood, a blood pressure check of some. Yes, yeah. every year in so, Scotland for nothing but blood pressure checks. Right. So now what we're talking about here is that um, we have the devices. Okay, we've long had devices that are medically regulated that anyone could use with a very small amount of training that could automatically upload those readings into NHS systems from anywhere. So. Brian's done a, a whole bunch of work, and we, mm. you know, a, a lot has been pushing hard on this very, very simple thing for about ten years. Yeah. Um, and how many people in Scotland are using this remotely? Well, it's just starting to take off. Actually, yeah. we've got one thousand three hundred people in Lothian now using this technology, and we're hoping this is going to rise sharply. It finally seems to have taken off at long last. But, but the issues are, are fundamentally: mm. do we trust the patient to collect something about themselves and contribute that into the system? Absolutely. And the answer is, we don't. <laughs> well, so, you, well, you know, at, at a system level, you know. patients are much better at checking blood pressure than doctors and nurses. But but that's but, but that, no, that's, that's the that, truth. That's they are much better than doctors and nurses at checking. But that blood evidence pressure. isn't reflected in our cultural approach to that mm. premise. And so, equivalently, the technology is there to do all sorts of things like this. We just don't, for some reason, at a system level, place trust in a citizen to be able to do these things. Uh, and as soon as the data comes from out with our control. Immediately, it's suspect. Immediately, the integrity of it is low. Um, so a lot of the data protection changes and a lot of the, the trust measures that are in those things are actually an enabler for these sorts of things. But um, uh, I'll, I'll, just very quickly, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of this is the systems behind the coll collecting the data, and there are ways of doing this. And um, the system that using Lothian collects it and sends it via Docman, which is the usual way that GPs get their um, lab results and their hospital letters and this sort of thing. It's been extremely unpopular. General practitioners uh, something like 40% of GP practices in Lothian have taken this up and there are others looking for it. So it, if, if, it's, if you get the formula correct, mm. then people will, will take this up, I think. I, I guess the point is at what stage do we say, you know, I'm just, just to be facetious here, by 2022, we will not be having routine blood pressure checks in a GP office because you know, at some point someone has to say that's not good enough. Yeah. And put something in place that says, by a certain date, everyone well, has to adopt this. We need a heat target or something. Like that. Yeah. Yes, um, I completely agree with all that's been said, but it's not just about um, not trusting citizens of their own blood pressure. Nobody trusts anybody else with the data and the other health professionals. So the duplication which is in the system routinely is horrendous. And that's what we say about working smarter. So yes, we need lots of extra resource for these big IT projects, which are the enablers of the culture. But... There's lots of things which we can be doing within what we've got already, and we don't make use of that. Okay. Sorry, Rami, I meant to bring you in earlier. Is the point passed? Or is it, it, the point's passed. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, Stephen. Uh, uh, telecare, you, you should give an example of telecare rather than telehealth applications, and, and certainly the Technology Enable Care Initiative has... I think driven some a lot of that aspect forward and, and there's now 1800 people in Argyll and Butte who are using telecare systems to help that type of thing to keep people independent and at home. I suppose the material issue about it is that's a funding stream that's going to come to an end this year. Um, how is that to be embedded nationally to, to go forward? Equally it's using and this is where I become a bit of a Luddite, uh, analog technology rather than digital. So there's a big transformational cost to shift it onto the digital platforms, which is key because then, peop then, we, then we are able to link health and care information together and responses. Uh, and that supports very much community resilience going forward. So the responder to that sort of example you gave there could well be a neighbour who, who can help in that way because they've been trained and supported in that partnership environment or a voluntary agency, not necessarily a health professional or even a care professional at that point because it's it's somebody working within their community neighborhood responses so the, the telecare aspect is is one of those really big material wins to help us manage demand on the service colleagues have already flagged the demand we're creaking on our services unless we radically transform the way we deliver services and i get your point brian about email traffic into primary care but to be honest 
If we don't change the way we deliver and operate our services, we can't even offer people online appointments, yet you can get them. I don't need to say, do I? We can get them everywhere else. Why can't we do that? Because our colleagues at the front line are on their knees and worried about that change. So that's a mandated change, and we have to radically change that. Um, and I have seen small, small evidence of that happening. I've seen practices actually using the telephone system to provide the first line of response, triage that workout, redirect the calls differently. But that's only telephone, actually. Video conferencing, consultations, we don't culturally grab that. Um, and, the, and the material issue to me is why don't we do that? Because we don't train the people who are coming through the system in what technology can bring. We expect people almost by osmosis to understand how it can be used and applied. And that's where we're going to fail if we don't pick up the pace on that in the next three or four years and give our clinical colleagues space to do that. I think that's an important point. I mean, the, the evidence that we've collected from our Joint Inspections of Health and Social Care Partnerships over the last number of years suggests that the investment in telehealth and telecare has had very positive impacts for people, particularly managing um, risk for frail older people, supporting them to live independently at home, um, and also bringing some peace of mind to those people, their carers and their loved ones, which is important. But the pace of change has not been consistent in all parts of Scotland. So there are partnerships where that pace of change has accelerated much more rapidly and that may in part um, relate to the point that Mr Cole Hamilton made a moment ago. It is worth saying around the um, uh, the pace of change around the digital world and technology is reflected in the new health and social care standards which were published in June which set out the expectation that people will benefit from technology which may be able to support them to live independently so whilst I appreciate that um, uh, uh, publishing a set of standards doesn't ensure that everyone experiences care that's consistent with those standards it is an important policy driver of partnerships thinking about how they will put in place measures to support people to live independently at home when they can do so and when they want to. Alex, then Marie. Thank you, convener. No, I, I'm really struck by the answers to my question. I had a, a fascinating afternoon with Dr Chung and his colleagues at the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, who opened my eyes to the fact that um, problems in A&E targets are no, not a result of an inadequacy in our emergency departments, but in fact, uh, an interruption in flow throughout the health service caused by the fact there is not adequate social care provision in our communities, which means that people are staying in the hospital for longer, and it means it's impossible then for um, doctors in A&E to admit patients to the wider hospital because there are no availability of beds. If social care is the weak link in this chain, which I think we all are all agreed that it is, then I'm astonished to hear um, Stephen Whiston talk about funding coming to an end for the rollout of social care. I'm also astonished to hear Chaloner talk about there being a cultural resistance to trusting patients and trusting the technology around this. And I want to ask the panel, how do we get past both of those things? Is this is this something that we need to take on as a parliament? Is there um, Do we need to mandate health boards better on this? And is this a, a piece of legislation? Sean? Wrapping on about this, but um, yes, there are very tangible things you can do if, you, if we can learn from other countries in this space. Um, the, the first one is a technical one, and I'll, I'll not get into the depths of it, but um, in, other, in some of these other countries, they have a principle of, sh of creating data once. Okay, So what they say is, you can have your own database, you can have your own system, you can have your own software packages, it, you can have this huge diversity um, as long as you share it into a central bridge. And there's, there's one bridge, and everyone has to connect to that bridge. And, that, and that's, a, that's a technical solution that is entirely feasible now. That's the spine you were describing yeah, earlier. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So in, in Estonia, it's called X-Road. Um, Digital Health uh, London has done, done it across all the trusts um, across London, and so that, that's, that's coming into being now. It's one bridge that everyone connects to, including the patient who can connect to it, see who is looking at their data, withdraw consent if they feel someone is misusing their data or not, not in line with their wishes. So that's your patient empowerment, that's your citizen rights, that's your data protection win. So that bridge is a very technical piece, but that's the leadership that says someone needs to say, here is the IT plan, which says there is going to be this bridge. Okay, Everyone has to connect to that bridge, but everyone can have their own stuff. And we're not going to try and control every single thing you do as long as you connect to the bridge. And that's where the standards uh, are set. So that's the, the, the technical requirement uh, to get all these different things speaking to each other, one bridge. Um, and that's not a health and care bridge. In Estonia, it's a banking, a post office, a benefits. As soon as, as, soon as they did health and care, everyone wanted it because 
all of a sudden you're not having to fill in forms every single time you want to do anything. All of a sudden you're not having to agree one organization to another organization, two years of information governance wrangling to get data shared between the two because everyone just connects to one thing, right? Um, so so, that, so that, that is the solution that these countries are, are rolling out. You mentioned Digital Health London. How much does a spine like that cost? So it's, in Estonia, it was three million pounds. Is that all? Yeah. So it's not about the tech. No, it's, I mean, I hear colleagues laughing, yeah. but you know, I'm looking at other IT de systems that this government has employed to failure, and they've cost significantly in, more in, than that. Interoperability is not a technical issue. Interoperability yeah. is a political, organizational, semantic, and then technical issue. Yeah. That, 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 that last bit at the end is actually the easiest bit. Uh, it's, it's agreeing the common definitions that everyone's going to work to. So when we say blood pressure, everyone understands what we mean by blood pressure. When we say paramedic, everyone understands. If you, if you agree all these things, the technical bit is the easy bit. Um, so, so it's the political drive in these other countries that has done this, and then the technical solutions follow very quickly yeah. uh, once you agree those, 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 those other ways. Is why do so many IT projects fail? <laughs> uh, I, I could rant for a long time about that. I'm not sure you want to. Maybe I shouldn't ask you yeah. to answer that. It just seems if it's all so easy, why does it end up such a complete bloody mess? But anyway, the um, like systems start from scratch as opposed to well, lots of legacy. Well, no. So the Estonian system started from scratch. The Finnish system had all the same legacy systems we have, and they've done the same thing. Uh, the, and, and, and the Galician system's doing the same, and in, in Holland as well. Marie. I really wanted to clarify with Professor McKinstry. I mean, I, I don't know if I was the only one around the table who was shocked to think that GPs might not use email at all. I presume you mean GPs don't use email to communicate directly with patients. <laughs> yeah, that's all I wanted. They can all use email, but they... Uh, <laughs> that's all I wanted to clarify. It or not. No, they, they, it's yeah. just that they don't, they don't use it to communicate routinely with patients. Yeah. And I think the major issue is the concern about overwhelming. The only cost to seeing a doctor is the difficulty in making an appointment. And if you lower the cost, then you will increase the workload. That's simple economics. Simple as that. Thank you, Thank you Convener, and good morning. There has been a much discussion about the relatively better performance in e-health of many of our European partners. Um, and I was intrigued to learn that the uh, European Commission has been consulting on uh, how we can promote and further integrate e-health across Europe, and particularly um, potential for cross-border communication. Um, and that strikes me very interesting, particularly with relation to the EHIC card. But of course, we are in a kind of situation where there's a great deal of uncertainty regarding Brexit. Uh, just specifically on the opportunities um, that could be missed um, as a consequence of Brexit for further integration, I would be keen to hear some comments. And then more generally, what guests believe are the potential risks that Brexit poses to the further development of e-health in Scotland. Who would like to go first? <laughs> I can mention certainly on the research side. Um, if you look at, uh, for example, there's a call coming out for 2020 um, looking at scaling up blood pressure. It's absolutely up our street. Scotland already leads the whole of Europe in this, I would regard generally, and we could really do this. But the big concern a lot of people have now is that despite the fact that we are allowed to apply for these things, that European partners are wary about taking on UK partners because they think that that might reduce their chances of getting funded. Is that something you've experienced already? We don't know. We like to think the reason we're not getting funded is that and not, not just because our, our applications are very good. <laughs> No. Okay. Yep. Yep. Brexit will not make any difference, I'm afraid, for data protection, just in case anyone thinks so. That will be out the window once uh, once we leave. Yeah. Um, the general data protection regulation will be transposed into UK legislation. Um, and so long as we want to continue to trade with Europe, uh, and if that trade involves the, the sharing of personal information, we will have to have a data protection regime on a par with Europe. So it will continue. Just in case anybody thought that it was going away. Yep. Talking about trade as well, um, I guess the, the point with these new data sharing norms that are starting to pop up around Europe is that our companies will not be able to take advantage of those markets mm. if we don't do similar things. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, I say this because uh, Estonia gets a lot of press because 
they have created a little cottage, cottage industry where they are giving out. Sony will give you their X Road system for free. It's 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 open source. You can literally go onto their website, download everything you need about it, and we can build our own without paying them anything because they've got hundreds of SMEs that then will then offer services to us to say, we know exactly how to optimize clinical systems on the back of these sorts of bridges. Mm -hmm. um, and that's their tactic, you know. Um, so there's a so there's something in here that says that uh, um, in a Brexit, a post-Brexit situation, uh, if we let ourselves diverge technically from the rest of the market, then the stuff we're selling won't be that interesting to the rest of the market. Yeah. Um, so the risk there. Okay. If I could just clarify, if the European Union of 27 move to water saturation, where there is greater interoperability between various systems, would that be the case then that for EU nationals of one country travelling in another, their, if they required medical treatment, that could be provided with greater effectiveness and efficacy than for countries who are out with that integrated system? Really? is um, a story of an American lady who wanted to access, uh, she didn't have her medication, and asked a pharmacist if they could help. The names are all completely different, um, different doses, all sorts of things. Um, and she just said, do you have access to the internet, um, which all of our pharmacies do not have either. And, and they, uh, with her password, he, the pharmacist could then access her medical information, including her hospital records, her consultant notes, absolutely everything that was necessary to uh, find out what medication she was on um, and actually give her continuity of care. That sounds very simplistic <laughs> when you say it like that, but that's not in the European Union. So, um, I, well, on that consultation, we thought, actually, going back to some of the comments that have been made, we have so many issues at home trying to get interoperability between our own systems that we didn't actually look at addressing that. It's too big a question for us as, a, um, as an organisation. But obviously, it can be done. I, I would have thought something as simple as access to the internet would have been part of a pharmacy licence to, to operate a pharmacy. Mm -hmm. So how, how, does a, how does a pharmacist then keep up with the latest information regarding they would do pharmacy that out, issues. They would do that outside working hours. Yeah. They, wouldn't have, they wouldn't have time during a normal working day when they run off their feet in a community pharmacy to actually uh, be keeping up to date and downtime to do that. But, but is, there, is that an expectation that uh, that we have on pharmac pharmacists that you, you will do that in your spare time? Of course, of course, of course. So yes, we have a continual, like all the other professions, we have a continual professional development which no, has I, to be I done. I find that, you know, I find that unacceptable, personally, I find it, that it, unacceptable. It, not having access to the internet obviously will hamper certain uh, IT enablers and, you know, some, some uh, premises will have it and some premises don't. And that's a corporate decision not to let their staff have access to the internet, um, which means it's a bit like the email situation with the doctors. It, it's... it's a stumbling block for certain things, depending on what IT solutions are being thought of. So, they, so if, I, if someone presented with a condition, they can't look up and find out the latest information? Not on the internet in some places. But they should have that information anyway. It's not going to be an issue on a day-to-day -day practice basis. That, that's not going to be an issue. But some systems would work through the internet to allow you access to health board information or various other sites, and you can't access that on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, Ivan, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I... Uh, uh, people might not be able to answer this question, and it maybe you want to take it away and come back with some data or point us in a direction where there is some data. But we've talked about um, a, a number of examples where the lack of joined up IT systems um, causes difficulties for patients in terms of the service levels, but clearly there's cost impacts there as well. And we talked about 1.2 million blood pressure readings that could be done at home and uploaded, and that obviously re much reduces the amount of resource that's required um, within the practice, etc. So it's just if anybody had any examples or, or was aware of any research on potential cost or efficiency savings that are there to be had um, by us joining up IT in a better way. And that might be savings today, or it might be that we don't need as much resource as we otherwise would have needed in the future. 
the use of technology um, would be, for example, in diabetes. Um, so di Scotland has got a marvellous system called Sky Diabetes where all information is uploaded centrally uh, twice a day from general practitioners, podiatrists, um, all over the country, and so there's a single record kept. This has had a dramatic effect in some areas, for example, and the diabetic foot and amputations have dropped dramatically over the last few years, and it's considered that this is at least in part due to the fact that this is a very joined up system in diabetes. Yeah, I suppose I'll look for some numbers on this, as in how much money it saves us. Well, I, I couldn't tell yeah, you. That, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. I've got, I mean, yeah. I've got a number uh -huh. for a European example, but um, you know, again, the Estonian example, but uh, their economic analysis basically says that they, uh, as a population of 1.2 million people, through having that bridge and uh, avoiding duplication of data sharing and, and data input, save 800 years. Um, of effort every year for 1.2 million people. We spend 100 years just booting up the computers <laughs> in general practice. So I'm not sure what that would translate to in, 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 in pound signs, but um, you know we're, we're talking huge administrative savings to be made for, for you know huge staff staffing budgets associated with just repeating the pro same processes over and over and over again. I think that's the, the material point. It's the productivity gains for our staff, reducing the burden of work on our staff. David gave an example of how long he's got to wait in his, in his team to or find information or make a decision which is not based on all that information being in front of that clinician. And, and I know from our staff that they're repeating assessments, they're repeating things, and, and it's just a waste of their time. And there's such a frustration to the patient or the client at the other end of because... You've asked me this question already. Well, it wasn't me, but I just need to check because it's not on my system. We would free up so much resource in our staff in time terms. So I'm not surprised at the, the, the years level that you talk about. It would be that factor. And remember, we've got an increasing demand. So how are we working more efficiently to cope with that demand? At the moment, we're burdening our staff with systems that don't yeah. ease down. I get all of that. And we're like, done that. I suppose I'm just trying to dig down. Is anybody any actual numbers on this? Because at the end of the day... That's what we need to be looking at. I, I, not numbers as such, but there was a small study done in England um, on 140 community pharmacists who, who got access to records, and about 92% of them said they used them to stop signposting a patient to somewhere else. 56% of that was to a GP appointment. So all of those GP appointments were immediately saved. So I think that's what I was getting at on the productivity. Um, there was just 1% going to A&E and 22% going to out of hours. So it's the impact on out of hours and GP. So it, again, it's, it's the duplication that we've all talked about down the line. One actual, so Nesta um, did a uh, study of this um, when you give a citizen the ability to contribute more actively into the co-management of care. Uh, and they did a, a kind of uh, literature review of all the different studies around that. And on average, it's a 7% saving uh, uh, with regards to outpatient uh, primary care and intermediate care um, uh, solutions, just, just by giving the, the citizen a more active role. Final question, because we really are... Uh, thank you, Vina. Uh, good morning, panel. Uh, what it seems to be described here is a kind of a, a disparate uh, uh, IT systems under quite a bit of stress. And what seems to happen within these uh, sort, of, sort of outdated systems is we upgrade them by bolting on software, uh, and, and the sort of degrading of that effectiveness for the, for systems that are not designed for current requirements in health. So I suppose the question to, to, to finish up is: is do we continue along that line, or do we? Establish a build protocol uh, with sort of sustainability and you know scalability, and and start again. There you go. <laughs> I'll, tell you. I'll tell you what we'll do then. Um, given we're nearly finished, if we maybe just go do a round table of the uh, our, uh, guests today, uh, just go round um, and you can have your say as a, a, for your last thirty seconds or minute. Um, and I'll go around everything. You can maybe address that, but some of your wider asks of what you think the main things that we should be reporting back in terms of our committee report on this topic. So um, we'll start at this side. Yeah, on you go. Um, I think uh, for me, obviously, it, it's the apparent uh, obstruction that data protection seems to cause. Um, and. I think a lot is down to, I mean, you spoke about disparate systems and bolting things on, and 
the the government policy that comes down tends to be the same. It's a bit disparate. So when we're called in to assist from a data protection perspective, then very often right hands don't know what left hands are doing in terms of, of that policy in within health in particular, I'm thinking. And one of my biggest concerns has been that um, you have this information sharing project or initiative and you have this integration initiative happening over here and the public don't get it. The public are not being engaged as a whole. Um, and so all that the public see is all the disparate bits happening. Um, and then it, all of a sudden they feel my information's out there. Um, the, we took a call from a, a member of the public in relation to the SPIRE project, the extraction of, of data from GP uh, records. Um, we sat on the, the steering group for that. Uh, the, an excellent privacy impact assessment was done for it. But this fell down because this member of the public went along to the GP practice, looked at a, a poster, missed all of the, the public information campaigns, looked at a poster, contacted that telephone number and didn't get the answers that he should have got from that telephone number. And instead, fortunately, because I had been involved in it, I was able to say, get onto the website, look at this, this is how it works, look at the privacy impact assessment uh, and talk them down off the ceiling, as it were, as a result. And for anything that's going to happen in an integrated way, sadly, whilst everybody in here can see the benefit of it, the public don't often. All they see is Big Brother. And so if anything is going to happen, for me, what has to accompany that is the public engagement okay. alongside it. Need to be a wee bit briefer than that. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd, yes. agree, I'd, I'd agree with that. Uh, um, and um, I think uh, my, my kind of summary would be share data once. So that, that as a principle, create data once, sorry, as a principle, um, and then reuse it many times. That bridge concept is, is seems to be critical in, in the prog progressing uh, uh, countries. Um, I think that GDPR uh, data protection is an opportunity, not a barrier, which is to say that if you want to centre care on the citizen, then why are we balking at the idea that they have some sort of consent-based uh, authority in the system? So. That, that, that's an enabler because then when that person takes their record to the pharmacy, the pharmacy can just look at the person's own record that they hold and share it in that way rather than a disparate system of back office systems that try and connect to each other and try and exclude the patient. So I would, yeah, I, absolutely. I think some of your solutions with Bridger are great. This sounds really, really good. But um, I think you need to look at consent in more detail because we don't actually have an overall system for consent. And I understand the Information Commissioner's um, submission and the, the concerns around that. Patients expect it to be confidential and the governance is really important. But, but patients expect healthcare professionals to have the information that they need to treat them. So and we don't have a system. We have implicit consent. We have some explicit. We have gaps all over the NHS which stop the system running smoothly. And I think the patients need to own a lot more of that. And going back to what was said earlier, really important that we do design the new systems, that it's the patients, the public and the practitioners that are all involved in that um, and not just the, the IT specialists. David? Yeah. Pretty much the same. So enable a framework and it's probably part legislative, legislative, part technical, so that data can be shared through consent. So a patient can say, right, I'm signing up to receiving care, social care, healthcare, whatever. As part of that bargain, you can explain to me that this information is going to be shared and I'm going to give my agreement in advance because trying to do it when somebody's unwell and going to say, do you have your consent for this, 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 this and this is absolutely not the time to do it. It's proven they can't give consent then legally. So it needs to be done before. Okay, Stephen? I would echo exactly what Aileen and David said is the key bits for me. But I would also say that we absolutely have to step up our mark about the training and cultural requirements to support our professional clinical colleagues at the front line at the moment they struggle with understanding what the transformation agenda can bring if we're going to embed this and make it drive forward we need to bring that to the fore okay rami and um, 
we've talked a lot about information sharing and systems used by professionals to share information, and that's important, but it's only one part of technology and digital health and care. And I think it's important not to forget the many emerging, sometimes quite simple technologies, mm -hmm. which are able to support people directly to either live in their own homes or to live in residential care homes. And the evidence that we've uh, obtained around that suggests that there are some really quite small, simple interventions which allow people to live well, live independently, uh, and live with a real sense of well-being and fulfilment. And technology can play a big role in that. So information sharing is important, but it's not the only part of what we need to do. Uh, yeah, I w I'd agree. Uh, digital healthcare literacy, not just for patients and carers, but also for, for staff and, so and social carers, is absolutely crucial moving forward. I would make a plea for a Once for Scotland approach to emergency anticipatory care planning, communication of information, because we have a real opportunity. I'm engaged with a UK-wide project at the moment looking at exactly that, and the Scottish Government is, is engaging with that work and has in fact uh, resourced some of the, the work to look at, at setting the standards and developing a clinical archetype that would work with the spine exactly in the way that, that you're talking about. But that would be a UK-wide approach to accessing the kind of information that makes a difference to the patient at three in the morning when they don't want to be admitted to hospital or they do want to be admitted to hospital and know exactly the kind of care that they want but in the crisis are unable to say what they want. So, so that's a huge opportunity, and that's one that we absolutely need to, to resource and engage with. Brian. Uh, rationalise IT governance, boost bandwidth, um, improve GP systems, and promote telehealth. OK, thank you very much. It's been a very interesting session this morning. I want to thank everybody for coming. Could I finally um, invite, I think it's Maureen and Stephen, to go for a cup of coffee and sort out that issue? And... Uh, and I'll say that in all seriousness and report back to us how you got on in trying to resolve that issue that emerged this morning. OK, we'll suspend briefly to change the panel. Thank you.
Uh, the second, second item on the agenda is consideration of one negative SSI. Uh, the committee will take evidence from the Minister for Public Health and Sport. Uh, uh, this item has been tabled as a motion to annul. This instrument has been lodged. The motion will formally, be formally considered at item uh, three. We welcome to the committee Aileen Campbell, Minister for Public Health and Sport, Mary Stewart, Team Leader, Health Protection Division, and Lindsay Anderson, Anderson Solicitor, all Scottish Government. Can I invite the Minister to make a very short opening statement? Thank you, uh, convener, and thank you for the opportunity to discuss with the committee Mr Balfour's motion to annul the functions of Health Board Scotland Amendment Order 2017. And as you've pointed out, I'm joined by Mary Stewart, Team Leader from the Health Protection Division, and Lindsay Anderson, Solicitor from the Legal Directorate. Uh, this instrument is required to empower NHS boards to provide free abortion services in Scotland to women who normally live in Northern Ireland. In developing this instrument, we have consulted with a wide range of stakeholders, including third sector organisations and NHS experts. In Northern Ireland, abortion is permitted in only very limited circumstances, and therefore hundreds of women travel to Scotland and England each year to access services here. This creates an inequality in it, inequality that is significantly addressed if these women do not have to pay for treatment. It is important that Scotland, alongside similar provision being made by the UK government, enables the women who travel here from Northern Ireland to receive clinically safe NHS treatment without being charged. I recognise that abortion can be an emotive subject and that there are a range of views held in Scotland and indeed in this room about it. In a similar manner to the UK government, we believe abortion should be available as part of a standard healthcare service for all women. Women in Northern Ireland who need abortion services face considerable challenges in accessing them. It is right that Scotland plays its part in providing clinically safe and legal care for women who have made this decision. And in light of these remarks, I hope that Mr Balfour will consider withdrawing his motion. OK, thanks very much, uh, Minister. Could I invite Jeremy Balfour to ask, ask any questions uh, that he may have? Um, uh, thank you, Convener, and thank you very much for having me. Um, um, I also um, agree with uh, the Minister's uh, closing remark that this is um, an emotive subject where people will have different views on. And the questions I have this morning are not in regard to the issue of abortion itself. It's some of the issues uh, behind that. And I suppose the first question I have to the Minister is in regard to the, the cost of this. Um, we are all very aware, and this year in the end of your debate uh, earlier on today, that our NHS in Scotland does have cost pressures, and there are pressures already on hospitals, doctors, etc. I wonder whether we have any comment in regard to what the cost this will be here in Scotland, um, how much will it cost, um, the number of people who we think might uh, come from Northern Ireland to Scotland to use this, particularly if we are offering it as a, a free service compared to going to England, as, we, as some people do at the moment. The second question I have is, does this set a, a precedent in regard to treatment? So again, for example, if in Scotland we find a drug that maybe helps children who are three or four years old in regard to cancer, but that drug is not funded in Northern Ireland, are we then going to say, because, we, because people in Northern Ireland don't have that, we can then fund that? And I do wonder whether there's an issue around precedent here of, of, of other jurisdictions. And I suppose the final question is in regard to parliamentary jurisdiction. Uh, and that is, whatever our view on this subject, the Northern Ireland Assembly has taken a view on that. And I just wonder whether um, we are interfering in other people's uh, jurisdiction. And also in regard to why just Northern Ireland? Uh, there, are, there are other countries within Europe who also have a similar view to that of Northern Ireland. Um, why are we limited simply to Northern Ireland? Why are we not seeking to expand it to other uh, Central European countries as well. So those are the three questions that I would have convened to the Minister. Thank you. Would you uh, like to respond? Yes, thank you, uh, convener. Um, as set out, um, I'm not sure if Mr Balfour's had the chance to look at that, but as set out in the, the BRIA, the Business Regulatory Impact Assessment, the cost of the policy, we believe, will depend on the number of women who choose to travel to Scotland, and we've set that out as being estimated as being between 17,000 and 98,000, around that 100,000 mark. However, it's important also to recognise that the Scottish Government will receive consequentials as part of the new spend required to fund the equivalently 
public policy in England that was announced by the UK government, and that will be used to fund the services here in Scotland. Uh, in terms of capacity, we're confident that uh, Scottish abortion services will be able to meet, uh, uh, treat women from Northern Ireland without having uh, a detrimental impact on the service to women in Scotland. And of course, that will require continual monitoring, and that's something that we will endeavour to do. Um, in terms of um, Northern Ireland and interfering in the uh, devolved uh, administration uh, assembly in Northern Ireland. This remains a matter that is uh, within Northern Ireland itself as a devolved matter. What we're doing though, if a woman chooses to travel to Scotland, that they are provided with the same uh, service and care that women in Scotland have and receive without being charged. That's the difference. If women from Northern Ireland choose to come to Scotland, that they are given that that same care and support that they would get if they had been uh, a woman uh, in Scotland. And in terms of the point around North uh, Republic of Ireland, you know, of course, this is around within the, the Republic of Ireland is a separate country in, in its uh, own right. This is about tackling inequalities faced within that kind of UK context. And just as the UK government announced that they would be seeking to ensure that women from Northern Ireland receive that care and support that women in England receive, that we want to do the same uh, in Scotland. We want to see Scotland play its role. So there's something very different and distinct around the, the women from Northern Ireland and the women from uh, Republic of Ireland. And um, you know, it's in line with what the UK government are doing in England. Back on any of those no, issues? No. Any um, members wish to ask any questions on that? Yes, for, for do you have an estimation of how much the Barnet consequentials are likely to be specifically on this? Um, we, uh, I don't think we have that uh, information at the present. However, that is work that will be ongoing and will continue to work with the UK government. That, you know, I think this is we have continued to work with the UK government on this. Um, but we set out what we anticipate this cost would be for a, a Scottish context, and any funding that we get from the, the UK will, of course, be used to um, to fund this, the service in Scotland. Uh, and we'll continue to work with colleagues in the UK government around this to, to provide that care and support for women who are travelling, making that journey uh, to have a, a very difficult um, um, procedure. Anyone else? No? Uh, thanks, Mr. Any final comments you wish to make, remarks you wish to make? Uh, no. no. Okay, no. thank you. We now move on to agenda item three, which is uh, the formal consideration of motion S5 M08451 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, MSP, asking the Health and Sport Committee to recommend that the functions of the Health Board Scotland uh, Amendment Order 2017 be annulled. Um, to set out the procedure, Jeremy Balfour will first speak to and move uh, the motion if he wishes to proceed with it. Then there is an opportunity for members to debate the motion and the Minister to respond. Uh, following debate, uh, Mr Balfour will be asked whether he wishes to press or withdraw his motion. Understanding orders, this debate cannot last longer than 90 minutes. Um, I don't think we'll last that long. Uh, could I ask uh, Jeremy Balfour to speak to and move motion S5M 08451? In the light of the uh, Minister's answers, I withdraw the motion. Thank you very much. Uh, are members content for Jeremy Balfour to withdraw the motion? OK, thank you very much. Um, as agreed, we will now uh, move on to into private session. Sorry.